Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Laura Namey, the Executive Director of the Society for Research and Child Development. Today's session is part of an initiative of our society um, to address parent questions relating to COVID-19. In case you missed it, we have hosted a couple of other sessions that you can watch on our SRCD YouTube channel, one on teaching and learning at home, one on screen time, and one on stress and coping during COVID-19. We're also recording today's session and we'll send the link out to everyone who's registered early next week. The focus of today's discussion is supporting Asian and Asian American children during the COVID pandemic. This is obviously timing, uh, timely given the pandemic and the anti-Asian sentiments that it seems to have stirred up. But it's also especially appropriate um, to be having this conversation right now because May is both Asian Pacific American Heritage Month and Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, the rise of xenophobia and anti-Asian sentiment is obviously a global phenomenon. And I know many of our attendees are participating from outside the US today. You're very welcome, of course. Um, our experts today are going to be focusing mainly on the experience of Asians in the US, but we hope the conversation will be helpful and relevant to other contexts where Asians are a minority within their community. I want to thank the many of you who submitted questions in advance. That was very helpful for us in identifying what topics you would find most helpful to see us address. Many of the questions that were submitted touched on similar topics. Um, and so I'll be raising questions that attempt to incorporate multiple parents' perspectives. So I hope you will cover your interest even if I don't ask your question verbatim. Uh, we'll certainly cover as much ground as we possibly can. And during the conversation, you're also welcome to post additional questions. You can type them into the question box on the little dashboard you see next to your screen. Um, we are monitoring that feedback and we will touch on new issues uh, that come up as time permits. Um, we are really pleased to have six experts on child development with us today. Uh, we're gonna break the session up into two parts and have three of our experts join us for each section. Uh, our first part will be specifically focused on COVID. And then the second half of our session today will be a more general overview of children's understanding of race and ethnicity and of the effects of discrimination on children. Um, I'm really happy to introduce our first group of experts for you today, who include Carissa Chia, a professor at, uh, of psychology at University of Maryland, Baltimore County, Dr. Richard Lee, who is a psychology professor at the University of Minnesota, and Dr. Kaveri Subramanyam, who is Associate Dean and Psychology Professor at California State University, Los Angeles. Um, Rich, let's start out by um, talking a little bit about, there's obviously a lot of ugliness being directed right now at Chinese and Chinese Americans in particular, and those of Asian ethnicities in general. Um, could you characterize what's going on? And, and obviously this is a unique set of circumstances and a unique time in our history, but can you also share your thoughts on how this fits with a broader, longer historical context of anti-Asian sentiment? Yeah, thank you, Laura. You know, I first want to acknowledge uh, the police killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis, Minnesota, which is where I live, uh, just a few miles from my home, because racism has a long history in America that carries forward today for all racially minoritized groups. And so what happens in one community um, has an impact in all of our communities. And this is especially true now during uh, this pandemic crisis of COVID-19. And so I bring that up because in order to understand the backlash against Asian Americans, we have to look at this long racialized history and for Asian Americans, it's a history uh, filled with xenophobia, the fear and hatred of strangers and foreigners, and the othering of Asians in this country. And it dates back to the exclusion of Chinese immigrants in the 1880s, to the internment of Japanese Americans in World War II, to the treatment of Koreans and during the Vietnam and the Korean Wars, to the treatment of South Asians during 9-11 and afterward. And so these events, these historical events are really important for us to understand because they've always positioned Asians as foreigners, forever foreigners, and not American. And on good days, sadly, we're always portrayed as model minorities um, as a way to explain or uh, explain away um, 
the racism that we see in society by positioning one racial group as successful to then discount the experiences of others. And so this all brings us to the COVID-19 pandemic we have here when we have you in particular American politicians using language like Chinese virus and Kung flu. Um, this kind of rhetoric is in, uh, inflames the fear and hatred against Asians and sort of structurally legitimatizes and allows people to publicly speak against Asians and to, to do uh, cause harm and violence. And because of the context, what we have now are uh, Asian Americans and African Americans afraid to go out with face masks and anxious when they do go out. Uh, and so that's sort of the broader context that I think we really need to understand and see how it's coming to a head not just in our community, but also in the African-American community right now. Thank you, Rich. I, I think that that's a really important and certainly sobering perspective to recognize um, how, how threatened people are feeling right now and what a long uh, legacy of this kind of, you use the term othering, um, and I think that that's a, that's a, a really key um, uh, framework for people recognizing that sort of marginalization or ostracization that people are feeling. Um, I know a lot of people are who are participating in the in the session today are really the families are really interested in um, what's going on with respect to how um, children from Asian backgrounds are being affected by prejudice or bullying. Um, but unfortunately, researchers are really being hampered from being able to collect data right now because we are so shut down as a society. Um, and so we don't know a lot. Carissa, you and your research colleagues are, are one of the few teams in the United States that is actively collecting data right now um, on how COVID is affecting um, Asian American children. Could you share um, some information about what you're studying and what you're finding so far? Sure, I'd be happy to. So we initiated our project, um, which is funded by the National Science Foundation in late February, early March uh, of this year. And um, in this project, we're focusing on Chinese um, parents and children uh, living in the United States. So uh, I have to also situate these findings um, with regard to our sample. And so we're interested in their experiences with different forms of um, racial discrimination, xenophobia, xenophobia, their identity development, um, and their mental health and behavioral social emotional adjustment. And so we are um, finishing up on the first wave of data collection where we administered surveys online and um, we will be following up with these families um, later on in the year into the early part of next year. And for a subset of families, we'll also, we are also conducting um, qualitative interviews to really understand their experiences in more depth, their lived experiences, and also to have parents share um, their experiences in ways that we as researchers may not have thought about. Um, even though, as Rich said, there is this ongoing and um, underlying, um, you know, a xenophobia, xenophobia, and racism, we are also living in a particular period in time where um, that's unique. And so um, we're trying also to capture some of these things that are occurring right now. Yes, and so, so you, sorry, sorry you the, the phrase xenophobia, which refers specifically to xenophobia um, directed towards Chinese and Chinese Americans, is that correct? Towards a Chinese culture, towards China, towards those of Chinese heritage, Chinese language, um, and so it's it's Chinese societies, and so that transcends um, all these different you know aspects of um, Chinese culture and life. Okay. And so um, just to share some of the findings that we have so far, we asked both parents and children. Um, to report on any experiences of racial discrimination and xenophobia that they've experienced as a result of COVID-19. Um, so some examples including include um, both experiences online. So people have shown me racist images online because of COVID-19. Um, you know, someone has said something negative about Chinese people, um, about their diets related to the COVID-19 outbreak or pandemic. Um, and we also asked them about 
experiences that they may have had directly. And so we started collecting this data before schools were, were shut down. And so we were able to capture some of these experiences. Um, and what we find is that unfortunately, and you know, pretty alarmingly to us, um, that many children um, have experienced at least one act of um, racial discrimination. So for instance, um, you know, 86% of children have reported microaggressions due to COVID-19 that they've experienced themselves, um, that you know, has been distressing to them. And at least 57% um, of children, up to 77% of children also experience either witnessing or experiencing online discrimination. And um, I think it's also important to, to think about how um, and whether these experiences are specifically to because of COVID-19 or whether there are experiences more generally. What we're finding is that some of these experiences are not new necessarily. So we asked about COVID-19 specific experiences, but also uh, microaggressions and racial discrimination more broadly. And we find that the rates are about similar, but when we look at more frequent reports of children who report experiencing these more frequently, um, we find that it, they're um, experiencing these acts and these um, events more so during COVID-19. That's really um, disheartening, but certainly helps to situate that this is a, 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 an imminent concern. Um, are you, I know you, you don't have necessarily have uh, the full range of age groups in your, in your study. Are there you finding age differences? Or are you hearing about differences in the types of exposure kids are experiencing depending on the age? So we have children um, between the ages of 10 and 18 reporting on their own experiences. And we find that not surprisingly that, well, all, first of all, all children are reporting these experiences, but older children and adolescents are reporting higher rates of discrimination. And that's not surprising because older children are more likely to be exposed to it. They're more likely to be in situations and contexts either online or um, you know, in person where they are out of um, the purview of their family, um, their families, which may be a protective factor you know, for them in some sense. Um, but I think that um, it's clear to say that all children are experiencing these um, effects. And the other thing I think that's also important to keep in mind is that our data also show that even with younger children, um, that parents' experiences of discrimination also um, seem to be associated with their children's reported distress. And again, so these are in not necessary children experiencing it, but if their parents are experiencing um, discrimination, we find that it's also impacting younger children. Right, the whole family is being affected. And this Absolutely. is a national sample that you're, you, you've got folks from all over the country that you're talking to? Yes, so it's not yeah. nationally representative um, right. in the sense that, right, but yeah, we are, we have right. families participating from all over the U.S. Okay, um, so Rich, let me come back to you. A, a lot of the parents are asking questions about either how do we explain to our children in age appropriate ways mm. what's going on, why this is happening, what to make what sense to make of it, but then also how do children cope, how do we help children cope and manage their own stress and their own um, fear about what's going on? Yeah, you know, again, just to go back to the police killing the other day, we've had this conversation with our children, you know, about what happened and the role of the police and the response of the community. And the way we approached it, and I think, and the way that um, the research suggests is that we need to first make sure that children feel safe and cared for. That's most important, right? Um, and then uh, we need to reassure them that things will be okay. Um, and once they have this security, then then I think it's it's appropriate for us to discuss with them what's happening in the world and in our society using the language that they can understand because their vocabulary is not the same as our adult vocabulary. Um, but it's also a time to 
teach them new terms to help describe their experiences, to help them understand what their feelings are. Because, uh, you know, kids don't know what racism is in the deep structural sense that we have an understanding. Um, and so they need to be educated in a way that makes sense to them. And then when they, then through that, they can begin to understand concepts like prejudice, stereotype, discrimination. Um, and even without building that vocabulary, I think we can engage in what we call racial socialization with our children. That is teaching children about what it means to grow up in this society as racialized minorities. Um, and talking with them about how some people are going to blame Asians, blame people who look Asian, um, because they have a prejudice. They have a stereotype um, that our politicians are uh, creating this hostile climate for us. And so I think talking about it just like that, even for my eight, nine-year-old, um, is understandable, but also frightening. And that's why it's important to go back to reassuring them that they're okay, that they're safe, that we're going to take care of them. Great, great. And um, Carissa, maybe you could, could tackle this question. So uh, I, I think, you know, lots of, of parents are having to answer difficult questions that their children are raising with them about what's going on. Um, but some children are not asking questions. Um, and, you know, within African American families, there's always this sort of needing to have the talk with kids about being prepared for and anticipating and knowing how to handle and react to uh, racial discrimination that might um, be happening to them. Is it appropriate to be thinking about, even if your ch child's not asking questions yet, to go ahead and have that talk with them proactively to prepare them um, to, to have some framework for expecting that something like that might happen? Or is that actually gonna just raise anxieties unnecessarily? Um, and does that differ depending on the age of the child? That is a really great question. And I know it's one that many parents, myself included, struggle with. So Rich just shared um, a lot of important ways that we can speak to our children, prepare them, and more importantly, give them tools to cope with the distress and fears and uh, ways to understand what they might be seeing, hearing about, or even experiencing. You know, I really, I want to say that, you know, we all understand that many parents, for many different reasons, um, really want to, to protect their children and are afraid to raise the issue um, if their children, particularly, you know, if they haven't brought it up. Um, that reluctance is, of course, natural, right? As I said, we want to protect our children from harm or distress. Some parents may be asking, why, why tell them how terrible this world is if they don't know yet? Maybe they'll never know. Maybe they'll never find out. Or maybe we'll talk about it later when they're older, when they're better able to understand what's happening and why. However, you know, we know from all this data um, that children are encountering and will encounter these issues in a myriad different ways. Living in a multicultural society is inevitable. And so it'll happen whether or not we talk to them about it. So with that same motivation, you know, of wanting to protect our children, wanting to, to, to protect them from harm, comes this need, really, for us to also be proactive about these issues. And so if you wait for something to happen, something negative to happen to your child, um, so if you take a more reactive approach, one of the issues is that your child does not, at that moment, have the framework to process what's happened. What if they don't tell you because they thought it was something that they did and, you know, time has passed by um, and, you know, they don't know how to make sense of it. They're more likely to feel powerless, um, more likely to be hurt by it. You know, of, of course, like any instances of, of discrimination and racism is going to be a negative for any of us experience, no matter how many tools we have, no matter how prepared we are for it. Um, and no matter how we understand, you know, sort of the structural pieces, but it's always more difficult to sort of undo the damage after the fact. And so by speaking with children before, again, as Rich said, in age appropriate ways, using language that they understand, stories, there are a lot of resources that are out there that are targeted towards um, younger children, even preschool children. Um, it, it's not just, you know, telling them that negative things will happen, but 
doing it with an empowering message and what role they play in this and, and how they can also um, protect themselves, protect others around them and change the world. And if parents provide children with good racial um, and ethnic socialization um, and strong ethnic pride, this gives children um, more of a sense of control over what they might encounter, what to do about it, how to process these experiences. Even if, as we all know, in the end, they can't control these experiences in the sense of what others do or say to them. That's great, Chris. And a number of parents have been asking questions about whether there's some specific examples of, you know, you, you talked about age appropriate ways to talk to the kids and that there are resources out there. Do you have, some specific examples of different ways that uh, conversations could be pitched um, to sort of give children a, a, an age appropriate kind of vocabulary. Rich, you talked about different, you know, introducing vocabulary, but obviously what a three or four year old can make sense of is gonna be very different from a school age child or an adolescent. Uh, do you have, either of you have thoughts on that? I think I'll just start off with um, just the, the cultural socialization piece, which is really transmission or giving messages to children about their cultural values, um, about the different you know, um, customs and their, from their heritage culture, um, about their cultural history, what are their traditions, and in doing so really um, imbuing children with a, a sense of pride in who they are. And that I think is the foundation to really um, giving children a sense of safety that, that Rich talked about. I think that's, that's one example. Yeah. You know, Rich, you talked to, you use the phrase racial, racial socialization. And I think that yeah. you know, socializing kids to be aware of race versus having pride and ownership in their own ethnicity and their own identity is uh, what I'm hearing you say is, is buffering. It is protective. Um, yes. for children so that when they see something ugly associated um, with their racial identity, they have a framework in which to put that. Is that a fair, fair characterization, Rich? Yeah, that's a great way to put it. You know, I mean, you, I think first, you know, one thing that Carissa brought up was the importance of ethnic and cultural socialization. And what we find in our research is that that's typically what parents will emphasize most early in a child's development, right? Because it's easier to understand. They see it in the decor of their room, in the foods they're eating, in the language spoken in home, and they need to begin to understand first that that's not something to be ashamed about, but to be proud of, right? Because it's most proximal. Race, right. racism is what's happening outside the world, mm -hmm. right? Outside the home. And so that's when uh, parents then need to begin to initiate those conversations as kids move, especially from early childhood and elementary school age to middle school. And really it's building that foundation of a proud, you know, having ethnic pride that allows them to then move toward beginning to have conversations around race and racism by the time they're being more influenced and exposed to peers. Yeah. So um, Kaveri, I have a bunch of questions I wanna direct at you in a minute, but one more follow-up um, thing that, that has come up is um, that I think Carissa and Rich, you were interested in maybe responding to is um, how how to think about um, important differences between first generation versus second generation Asian Americans um, and how the conversations and uh, experiences might differ. Yeah, I can start. Um, you know, one of the things, so we've been studying how people are treated, Asian Americans are treated as foreigners. And one of the things we found in that research is that um, immigrant Asian Americans often don't perceive or respond negatively to comments around being seen as foreigners, so questions about your language or your citizenship or residency. Um, but U.S. born American, Asian Americans are much more impacted and are reporting these in a greater amount because for Asian Americans who are born here, that is much more of a personal affront. You know, it, it is unambiguous to them what those comments mean. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the same way, immigrant parents often are more inclined then to avoid having conversations and avoiding the conflicts associated with those instances. Um, and so that may be where they often are more likely to, to um, resort or, or rely more on ethnic socialization. Just be proud mm -hmm. of who you are. Okay? Be proud mm -hmm. of your ethnic heritage. And in a way, they end up minimizing the racialized experiences that the kids are still having to sort through and struggle with. 
Mm -hmm. uh, whereas for US borns, I think there's a much more active engagement uh, proactively and reactively uh, with these types of incidents. Um, and so that's, I think, a big difference that we often mm -hmm. see. Um, Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. We see that in our research as well. Um, and uh, um, a lot of our research also works with first generation um, immigrant parents. And so talking with them about um, some of the struggles that they have with um, engaging in, in racial and ethnic socialization. Um, I want to speak to that also a little bit from a, a personal perspective, if I may, um, as a first generation Asian American. Um, and I myself did not have a good understanding of the historical background and of um, race relations in the United States, as Rich you know, outlined. And like many first generation parents, my own parents also socialized me and taught me to just focus on my studies, focus on why we gave up everything to relocate, you know, mm -hmm. focus on what the things that you should be grateful for, keep your head down, work hard, don't make trouble, stay out of mm -hmm. trouble. And staying out of trouble includes ignoring or not speaking up when something like this happens to you, especially when it's microaggressions, things that you don't, you know, you can just look away or pretend you didn't hear, pretend that the intention was not negative. And my parents' ideas were based on a combination of maybe fears about our legal status, um, whether legal or not, that just we might be kicked out if we make trouble, we might stand out and you know people might look at us. Maybe it's the idea that we it's not really our place to say anything because you know we're, we're we we moved here and so we shouldn't comment on the various various racial struggles that are happening. It's not our place, and. Um, you know, which is also probably situated in a lack of understanding of these issues. And so I've had to learn a lot of this, you know, myself. And that's what I would encourage, you know, any parent, first or second generation who feel as if they don't have a good sense of what's happening. That's the really the first thing that you should do before, you know, or along with, you know, socializing your children is to also socialize yourself and to have a better understanding of our place in this multicultural society. And um, we find also that many first generation parents have moved from societies where they were the ethnic racial majority or from societies in um, where it was a homogeneous society where they did not have to, to deal with a lot of these experiences. They're new to them. And so even where you've moved to, right? So whether you grew up in, you know, you moved to Connecticut or, you know, Michigan or New York, New York City, even, um, each con local context is different. And so there's a lot of learning for first generation parents to do. And it's daunting and it can be scary. But I hope that, you know, we know that it's important. Um, and, and also, you know, that there are things that the empowering, the message of empowerment here is that these are things that we can do. We yeah, are, right. you know, that we are empowered to do, that we have the resources to do. Um, and that I should note also that many second generation parents also may not feel particularly prepared. So just right. having lived through it doesn't mean necessarily yeah. that you know how to socialize your children because a lot of second generation parents, own parents, maybe didn't engage in these practices right. with them. So they don't have you know, these uh, cultural knowledge to draw on uh, from their own experiences as well. Yeah, I do want to- think... Oh, uh, go ahead, I just, to add, I just wanted to add one thing because it really follows what Carissa just brought up around being even second generation Asian American or third generation Asian American parents don't always necessarily know what to do or say. And I remember um, after uh, the LA riots and the Rodney King beating, um, I was fortunate to meet with uh, K.W. Lee, who's the godfather of Asian American journalism. And, he mentored me during that period and he said to me one day, you know, as a second generation, you have the King's English on your tongue. And your parents have been waiting for the day for you to speak up for them. Mm -hmm. And that's always stuck with me because that's really where we're at right now in society. So right. we need to speak up for not just our children's generation, but our parents' generation as well. Mm -hmm. And so we're in this unique position now where we have to be the ones empowering the generations behind us and in front of us. Right. Thank you. And I think this is it's it's so important to sort of recognize that 
the diversity of perspectives based on experience and the opportunities for us to take a lens that's a little bit different, a view that's a little bit different than what we might have experienced ourselves to recognize um, how critical it is for different generations and different backgrounds, different experiences. I want to switch gears um, a little bit because I want to make sure, Kaveri, we have uh, you. You have a, a unique set of expertise that I want to make sure that we tap into because a number of parents have asked questions um, relating to media and technology, which is it, it's your sort of area of expertise. And so I have a, a series of questions that I wanted to, to check in with you about. Um, Sure. And you know, at some point here, we're going to need to transition to our other our other group of experts here. So um, let me start out by asking. I think that a lot of parents have been interested in how are um, the ways that images and descriptions in the media are influencing um, children's understanding of what's going on and contributing to anti-Asian sentiments that are are um, being expressed right now. Sure. And, you know, uh, that was a great discussion, Rich and Chris. I learned a lot as well. Um, my children are much older, but I think the question of, uh, you know, racism in the context of media um, it has very several different dimensions. You know, we know from a lot of research on television and now digital media that media representations matter, media content matters, and media consumption matters. Uh, representation is probably the most challenging because unfortunately, uh, we Asian Americans, we are largely invisible or when we have when we are represented uh, it's stereotypical it's whitewashed or we are this you know we are the psychic or the villain right so uh, i think this one is challenging in terms of traditional entertainment media we'll have to see what happens going forward we'll have to be vigilant in terms of advocating as well for more realistic representations we know there's going to be movies on this pandemic uh, so it's important to talk to, mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll talk in a minute how we can deal with those media images. With regard to new digital media, it's so much more complex because it's just the sheer variety of different digital apps and uh, content. And it's um, and we know again that media content can influence thoughts, emotions, and images depending upon people who are suggest, especially for people who are suggestive to these images. So let me just switch briefly to what we can do as parents. So in the parenting literature, parenting and media literature, we, we talk about parental mediation. This is how parents interact with their children over media use. Uh, there's really two, the two main kinds that we read about a lot. Uh, one is restrictive mediation. The other is what we call active mediation. In restrictive mediation, we are limiting um, children's media consumption. And this was much easier to do when we had one television in the den. It's much harder with new digital content, especially because oftentimes children are the experts, right? Children know much more about these spaces than us parents. So this is where I think uh, some restrictive mediation is appropriate early on when children are young, but it's really more important to have uh, to engage in what we call active mediation. This is where you really help children deconstruct media images. Uh, you, you have those important conversations. You, you help them develop those critical media literacy skills, help them dis distinguish between fantasy and reality, uh, help them consider, for instance, sources, media sources, credibility, what are credible sites, uh, what are not so credible sites? How do you distinguish between them? Now, I want to be mindful also that parents are already trying to work at home while also, you know, helping, you know, do their, uh, you know, the, the school task, leading that. So I don't want to add one more thing on teach parents' plate, but I think having those sorts of um, active me uh, mediation where you give the, your children the skills and this is exactly what Rich and Carissa were talking about with regard to socialization and helping uh, you know sort of with ethnic pride again giving children those tools so that they can uh, more um, more in a more discerning manner uh, um, consume these media images and me media content. Thank you. That's really that's really helpful. Um, and yeah, you know, as you say, there's a balancing act to be struck because parents are overburdened already. But having a sort of clear set of um, strategies in place, and then helping to be transparent with your children about what those strategies are and why. Um, so sure. let me shift. We do need to 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 shift to to our next um, uh, uh, set of experts in a minute. But I, one more really sure. important question that's been asked by a couple of of parents is. 
um, about children experiencing cyberbullying, and obviously Carissa was sharing that that is happening. Um, mm -hmm. uh, do you have strategies that you could offer to parents for how to help their children cope with these these situations? Sure, uh, and actually some of the strategies really refer to setting the context because there are two things we learn from the literature. One is that actually most children don't tell adults in their lives about mm -hmm. cyberbullying. Majority only talk to their peers. Mm -hmm. And what is the reasons why they don't talk to either teachers or parents about it? One is uh, they're scared nothing will happen. Which and you know cyberbullying is really challenging. And the other thing is that they'll actually the bullying will get worse or they'll be made fun of. The other thing that they're really wor worried about with regard to their parents is that parents will you know sort of reflexly take away access to these media. And so these are really the two findings that stand out. So I think. First and foremost, what's really important for parents is to set up the tone, if you will, set up the stage so that the children actually tell them uh, when they do get cyberbullied. Uh, then, of course, as Rich said early, um, previously, the important thing is to uh, provide some support and empathize and, you know, maybe share some experiences. It's a little hard, especially if you didn't grow up experiencing these. But then it's also important to, uh, you know, encourage your child not to respond to the bullies. But it's also important to take images and keep track of the evidence because sometimes that could be, you know, save the post, save the message. Uh, but then, you know, also, I think the other thing here, the important role is going to be for school districts because, you know, while they all have cyberbullying uh, policies, this is a new world, right? I mean, all the instruction is happening at home, online, off the school ground. So I think school districts are going to have to rapidly ramp up and come up with some policies to help parents be more proactive in, in getting these incidents to their attention. Great. Thank you, Kaveri. Um, unfortunately, I think it is time for us to transition um, to the next section. Thank you so much to our first set of experts um, for sharing such really, really important information and guidance um, on how to protect our children and support them um, from exposure to xenophobia and the harm that could cause. Um, we do wanna shift gears at this point um, and introduce a new set of experts. Um, as a reminder, um, uh, anybody in the audience is welcome to post questions um, in the in the box on the dashboard and we are recording this session so um, we will share the link um, and uh, early next week. Um, we're going to turn now to um, a discussion of a broader overview and perspective on what the research tells us about how children understand race and ethnicity um, and how that develops more generally and what we know about the harmful effects of discrimination on children more generally. I think a lot of these themes um, have already been alluded to and introduced in the first half, but I think that we can sort of uh, expand on some of these things and think a little bit more about some of the more directed opportunities um, to think about this. And I, I will foreshadow that um, uh, we're getting a lot of questions um, in the in the chat uh, discussion um, from families who are not of Asian ethnicities themselves and really interested to know how they can be um, supportive of um, Asian families and children and how they can help to mitigate effects as well. So we'll make sure to touch on those questions also. Um, I'm really happy to introduce our next set of experts. Um, we have we have uh, Dr. Sun Yun Che. Uh, from uh, a professor, professor of Social Service Administration uh, at University of Chicago, Dr. Rashmita Mistry, who is a professor in the Education Department at University of California, Los Angeles, and Dr. Tiffany Yip, who is a psychology professor at Fordham University. So thanks to you all for being here as well. Um, Rashmita, maybe you could start us off by talking a little bit about what we know about the research on when do children even start to notice race and ethnicity as a thing? Um, how do they start to develop an understanding of what that means and what that translates into their own sense of ethnicity? And, and how, do, how do we foster this kind of healthy, prideful um, identity that, that we were talking about in the first half? Great, thanks, Laura. Um, I just wanna say also that I was fast and furiously taking notes based on what Rich and Kavari and Carissa was saying as well, because I think there are a lot of natural overlaps. I'm gonna try to keep my comments because I know there are a lot of other questions, um, but I'll start by just saying that I think when we look at when children first start noticing race, we're often surprised by how early it happens, especially as parents and educators. 
Um, in my own work, we've often been told, oh, children don't notice that, right? They, they don't notice differences. We want to just promote a sense of egalitarianism, a sense that we're all humans, we're all a collective. But what the research actually tells us is that even very early on, even as early as infancy, babies are noticing differences, right? And they're noticing differences based on perceptual characteristics. So this is things like skin color, this is things like physical features or hair and things like that. Now that's very different from saying that they understand a sense of a social construction of race as we talk about it. And it's very far removed from thinking about racism. But those initial inclinations just to be able to sort between fami what's familiar and what's not familiar is present um, very early on in life. In terms of when children first start noticing something more akin to race, we find the evidence that it exists by as early as ages three and four. So this is when children are starting to really first verbalize differences that they see amongst individuals based, again, on very concrete features, so things that they can see, right? So this will be skin color is a big marker for racial differences for young children, hair and hair texture, and then kind of more perceptual features. And this really to signals that children are just naturally curious and they're observing what's in their everyday environment, and they're doing a sort of intuitive sorting and classifying, right? This is when they're first starting to say, who looks like me, who looks different from me, what goes together, what doesn't go together. And that lends itself to a lot of kind of naturally curious questions, right? So you might be in a grocery store, and a young three-year-old might point out that the person in front of you their skin color looks like chocolate milk, right? And as parents, we often feel uncomfortable with that because in our minds, they're actually invoking a kind of more of an adult notion of race, but for a child's perspective, they're really just observing. So it's how we handle those conversations can send really strong signals and cues, especially to young children about these are natural questions but when we shush our children and we kind of demonstrate in some way that we are uncomfortable, over time, children get the signal and the cues that this is not something we talk about. This is something I might observe, but I'm not going to ask about it because the adults in my world are not comfortable with that. So it's really kind of around age three and four that they're developing this sense of racial differences. And then a little bit later is when they start applying some of those differences to themselves. So kind of four, five, six, and seven is when children start identifying themselves, right? So I am like African-American, I am Asian, um, I am white, black, whatever terms are being used in their environments. That process of identification and identity development continues into later childhood, continues into adolescence as children's cognitive skills um, develop, as their environments become more complex, as they change schools, they're picking up a lot more information. And we know that as identity comes to the foreground, they're also really sensitive to these kinds of messages that um, we talked about in the first half, right? So this is where ethnic pride and socialization um, strategies become really important for supporting this healthy sense of um, development. And then I'll say a couple more things and then I know we need to move on. So I think the socialization strategies are, are essential. How parents start these conversations early on with children, how they really develop this sense of pride in who you are and where our family is from and heritage and how we celebrate and honor um, and respect our culture is important. I will say um, parents often think that taking a more colorblind approach is protective and that's one of the things we know from the literature, especially for white parents. Um, it actually is doing a disservice to helping your children try to better understand um, racial ethnic differences and similarities, right? When those meaning differences are meaningful, when they're not. And then the last point I wanna make is in terms of um, supporting healthy relationships or supporting healthy development, this is for both children of color and white children. 
exposure to diversity matters. It's hard to have the talk when talk, that talk, that diversity is not represented. And this can happen if you live in a very kind of multicultural, very diverse community, but it can also happen when you live in more homogeneous communities. So I think this is where parents and educators need to be very intentional and mindful of representation. So this is you know, something that Kavari already brought up. It can be through children's literature. It can be through children's programming. It can, you know, Sesame Workshop does an amazing job of really trying to incorporate diversity in lots of different forms. But as parents and educators, I think we can do a better job of ensuring that what our children, our young children especially, are exposed to really reflects the kind of diversity that we are interested in having them um, be exposed to, but also learn about as well. So I'll stop it there for now. That's great, Rashmita. Thank you. I think it 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 really is. Thank you for bringing together the threads of not just sort of being part of an of an ethnic minority group within a particular context, but also um, how any of us from any ethnic background um, can can be very deliberate about talking with our children in ways that are comfortable. And then, you know, for families who are in environments where there's not a lot of diversity and not a lot of opportunity, that we can be deliberate about exposing our children systematically through media um, uh, and other opportunities um, to be able to, to recognize that that diversity is uh, a normal and healthy and, and exciting part of of, uh, of developing and, and growing up as a child. Um, let's let's switch gears a little bit to um, some of the the more um, you know negative concerns that we have about um, racism and discrimination. And Yunsen, maybe you could talk with us about the research and what the research says about long term effects of being systemically. Uh, systematically exposed to racism and discrimination, how that affects children's development, and how we can try to help protect or, or buffer children from those negative effects. Sure. Um, so there's a plenty and extensive research that shows that discrimination and racism are harmful and detrimental to children's development from mental health, behaviors, to school performance, and the effect also can be lasting. And different types of racism invoke different reactions. So for instance, sort of overt, explicit, sort of to your face racism leads to anger, like immediate anger and frustration, not only just the safety, but subtle and implicit racism leads to depressive symptoms, self-doubt, brooding and such. And all these sort of the array of emotional problems can lead to behavioral and physical health as well. And similar to what Carissa earlier said, that when there's a family member experienced racism, there's a spillover effect. So even if you didn't experience it, if your child or your parents have experienced it, that adverse effect also get you as well. And in my recent research that I follow, uh, young Asian Americans, about over 800, in their transitions from adolescence to young adulthood, so between 2014 and 2016, uh, many of you remember how race became sort of the hot issue and racial tensions sort of the rise and like significantly um, sort of increased. And we uh, also found corresponding increase in mental distress. So for instance, the suicidal ideations, like thinking about killing, them, killing oneself or wanting to die, increased from say 9% to 16%. And it was almost like, you know, the direct correlation between the increase in racial discrimination and mental distress. And especially among the, the young people who are 18 and 19, their rates were double of the national uh, average. This national average is 11% in 2017, but my sample, they had a 22%. So this is very unfortunate. What's alarming is that this is pre-COVID-19. So with all this increase in COVID-19 related racial tax and sort of the whole this anti-racism uh, climate, we can only expect this is gonna get worse significantly. Yeah. So that's what's happening. But you know, what we wanted to know what can buffer sort of these negative effects, and that's what I think are interesting. I mean, and many of the parents wanted to know. And um, I will suggest at least two. There are many ways, but at least two. And one is to establish really uh, strengthen the parent-child relationship, like really strengthen 
and positive. And often what we forget is that you know, parents, as well as the family can be a source of stress, but the family can be actually a source of support. Then even if anything is happening outside, when you have very solid, positive, close relationship between parent and child, that really seems to buffer a lot of adversity. And second, I think we have all the panels that have talked about the importance of the, you know, sort of the teaching the children about racism and why it happens and how it happens. And, mo and which is really important in this sort of time of pandemic, but what's also important is sort of the positive, like really sort of the send positive messages by, uh, you know, sort of instilling the pride and, you know, knowing about the culture and heritage. And these sort of the positive messages really seem to empower kids and give hopeful messages to children so that they, instead of feeling defeated and like hopeless, that they, they feel like they have something to do about it. Thank you, Yinsen. I think I think we're we're hearing this message come through in a couple of different ways about how important um, sort of the family support and the sort of uh, positive messaging about identity um, really are. But I think it also just really reinforces that the stakes are high, the risks are real. Um, Tiffany, this has come up before too, but do you have some some additional thoughts to share about the issue of you know being specifically targeted as is one sort of traumatic experience for kids, but um, versus the kind of what's called vicarious discrimination, where you're sort of perceiving and seeing how others are being affected or how entire swaths or groups um, are being affected. Do you have some thoughts about how to help children um, process those messages? And in particular, anything about sort of how we might see age differences in how, how to help kids make sense of those things? Yeah, thank you, Laura. Um, this is a new and developing area of research. So a lot of the earlier research on discrimination focused on really direct experiences targeted at children and individuals. And now we are recognizing that you don't have to be the target to experience some of the negative consequences of discrimination. And some of the more um, compelling research actually comes from Asian families um, looking at caregiver or parent experiences of discrimination. I think Carissa um, alluded to some of this earlier earlier in the first section, but parents, um, Asian parents who experience racial discrimination, um, that the stress of that impact has a direct effect on children's outcomes. And so I think it's really important, particularly particularly in this time of social distancing, when children are not necessarily interacting with this with their friends and their peers, does it mean they're immune to the effects of discrimination, both direct discrimination via media outlets that Kaveri talked about, but also through um, their close um, family or siblings, um, that those experiences also have a negative impact on um, children. And we can't, um, sort of ignore that fact and we can't overlook that fact. Um, and in terms of sort of circling back to thinking about, um, you know, how we can protect our children both from direct and vicarious discrimination experiences. Um, so just adding to what Yunsun said, one other thing that our research has shown, we did a, um, a synthesis of all the research that's been looked at, um, looking at identity and discrimination, and it, it included about 20,000 individuals. And what we found in that study was that a strong sense of ethnic identity um, so that that buffers the impact of discrimination. So what does that mean for parents? It really sort of ties back some of the conversations we had in the first part with socialization, pride, those sorts of messages culminate in a sense of identification for children, being a member of a particular racial ethnic group. And those feelings of pride, those feelings of belonging, those actually do buffer some of the negative effects of discrimination. So, you know, to the extent that we cannot, our children do not live in bubbles, and as parents, we cannot, we cannot protect them from discrimination, right? As Carissa was saying, they will experience it, no matter how well we parent or not. And so I think as parents, what we can do is think about how to give our children tools, how to talk to them, like um, in terms of socialization, but also taking that those socialization messages and forming a healthy sense of self and pride as a member of a particular group. And um, I think it's also important, um, Laura, you mentioned there was some um, interest in sort of thinking about how non-Asian families can help um, 
you know, cope with or help Asian families cope with some of the things that are going on. I think it's also worth mentioning sort of as a bridge to that conversation that about 30 percent of Asian families are mixed heritage. And so what's interesting about that is that brings a whole other layer of complexity when we talk about race, when we talk about racism. Um, and there is evidence to show that children who are multi or biracial actually experience higher rates of discrimination than children who are not multi or biracial. And so that I think just um, sort of challenges us as parents and educators to think about, you know, a sense of belonging and how that is um, how that gets sort of um, not complicated, but what how it might look different for um, children who come from mixed race um, families. Um, and so then bridging to that, maybe what um, non-Asian families can do and think about is this notion of allyship, right? So, you know, although um, most of our kids, or I would argue all of our kids will experience discrimination. I would also argue that all of our kids, regardless of racial ethnic background, will experience some sort of um, discrimination, bullying, something that makes them feel, um, you know, bad about themselves. And so I think all kids can relate to that. They've all been picked on on the playground, been called names, been left out. And so if we can have our children sort of relate to that on a more human level, right? How does it feel when you're being left out for whatever reason it is? It may not be race. Um, think about how that feels and think about what you would want your friend to do, right? Um, so having those conversations, whether or not you know, your your child's a target, whether or not, you know, it's even targeted at your group, I think can be helpful segues for families to have, again, these sort of proactive conversations about, um, you know, supporting people regardless of their backgrounds. Thank you, Tiffany. Thank you for addressing those questions, both about um, white ally uh, families and also about uh, biracial, multiracial families, because we have had some questions about that as well. Um, we are rapidly running out of time. I want to pose one more really important question. There's lots more questions that I wish we would have time for, but um, Yunsen, maybe I could ask you to address a really key question that a lot of parents have raised is, um, how do parents manage their own anxieties about all this? Of course, it's happening to them, but it's also their terror and their anxiety for their children. Do you have some very quick um, thoughts on how we can help parents to manage their own stress about all of this situation? Well, I think we need to acknowledge that we are all going through tough times. This is hard for everyone and it's unprecedented, right? And on top, a lot of us are dealing with this added challenges of helping the children and there's sort of the vulnerability to cyberbullying and discrimination, a whole lot. So I think we need to acknowledge and self-care is critical. We need to take care of ourselves. We need to utilize and build the sort of the network to support provide ourselves support. If needed, reach out and seek help, you know, tele-therapy whatsoever, and support one another. And for some parents, maybe even getting involved in sort of community uh, organizations or grassroots activities might be a help. And um, when it happens to you, I think it's important, like when you experience or your child is experienced, don't personalize, take I mean, be more proactive, report to teachers or whatever website that collects the information or law enforcement and don't just be silenced because that's going to really be harmful. And I think we have talked a lot about learning through this process, right? And just one of the very concrete example will be that recently the PBS have created this whole series on Asian Americans. Mm -hmm. It's more than five hours to just give you a heads up, but it's in different segments. It's uh, it, right. You, it's uh, free for viewing until June 8th. And this will be a great sort of the family activities. The families can sit down together and learn about the history of different group and the complexity of the history and interrelationship among Asian Americans. Great. So I would strongly suggest, and so sort of, you know, this is sort of cliche that, you know, take this as a learning opportunity and we're going to plug through this together. Great. Thank you, Yinsen. I, I 
wish we could have more time. We are at the top of the hour. I want to thank our panelists. I want to thank all of you for uh, attending. Um, I hope that this has been both interesting and helpful. Um, I think that we've, we've learned a lot um, throughout the session. Um, uh, we will be sending a link uh, to the video to everyone who has registered and we will post it on our website. So please do feel free to share with family and friends who might find it useful as well. Um, you all will be getting an email later today inviting you to complete a short survey. We'd love your feedback on today's conversation if you have the time amidst all of your other competing obligations. Um, from all of us at the Society for Research and Child Development, thank you again for joining us. We wish you and your families health and serenity during these difficult times. Thank you. <laughs>